episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Well, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with not one but two fascinating guests uh, helping to create a better tomorrow on, uh, on many fronts and we have an extremely important topic for uh, you today. Um, joining us first, uh, we have uh, Mr. Bakari Tandia, an extremely well-respected uh, dynamic human rights advocate uh, with extensive background in promoting human rights and social justice causes. Uh, and he is also the co-founder of the Abolition Institute, which is a group working uh, to promote awareness of and dedicated to ending uh, the practice of slavery, uh, primarily focusing on the West African country of, of Mauritania. Uh, Mr. Tandi is a graduate of the Global Master's Program in International Affairs at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. He also holds a bachelor's degree in international criminal justice from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, City University of New York, and criminology from the University of Abidjan and Ivory Coast. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Mr. Tandi is a graduate of the Human Rights Advocates Program at Columbia University, where he served as an advocacy workshop facilitator, uh, helping to educate and empower human rights activists around the world. Uh, he also works as a case manager and policy advocate at African Services Committee, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and self-sufficiency of the African community uh, in New York City and beyond. Uh, we also have the honor of being joined by Sean Tenner, uh, who is the other co-founder of the Abolition Institute. He's president of KM and I Communications, uh, and as a graduate of Georgetown, he spent his career working for organizations and officials dedicated to social justice causes as well and public interest. Uh, Mr. Turner served on President Obama's campaign staff uh, during both his U.S. Senate and presidential campaigns, he's had leadership roles in a variety of innovative nonprofits addressing both local and global issues. Uh, Mr. Tenner helps lead Illinois public policy for the Simon Wiesenthal Center, one of the world's leading anti-hate groups, uh, was appointed uh, by Illinois Governor Pat Quinn in 2012 and 2015 to the Illinois Holocaust and Genocide Commission, was an early leader in the Save Darfur movement in Illinois, and uh, works closely with refugees from violence in Darfur and South Sudan uh, who are building new lives in Chicago. Uh, he also works uh, with Chicagoans uh, who fled apartheid South Africa, serving on the board of uh, Color Me Africa Fine Arts, which brings apartheid Europe protest artists to Chicagoland to share their stories and their lessons. Uh, he's done work related to post-conflict reconciliation in both Rwanda and Northern Ireland. It's been profiled uh, on CNN for his work uh, in co-founding the Abolition Institute. Uh, he's also a former president of the Susan G. Komen for uh, the Cure Chicagoland affiliate uh, and works to address the epidemic of youth suicide uh, throughout his work on the Board of Directors of Hope for the Day, uh, Sip of Hope, one of the nation's most innovative mental health organizations. Uh, all that being said, Bakari Tandia and Sean Tanner, thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk about this important topic. Thank you for, having for us. inviting us. Yeah, it, it's, it's really an honor to have you both here uh, and, and a really important topic. Um, I, I'd like to start things off uh, as I typically do just by uh, giving you both the floor each for a few minutes to, to talk a little bit about how this issue of of slavery, uh, here we are in the year 2021, uh, came onto both of your radars and how this became such an important uh, topic for both of you in your respective careers. Uh, so I think since, uh, you know, I have been on the show, I will uh, give the privilege to Sean, you know, to start. Uh, so Sean, you have the floor. Sure. Well, um, I had always been interested in the history of uh, abolition, emancipation, reconstruction uh, in, uh, in college. One of my, uh, one of my final uh, projects at Georgetown had to do with the uh, what was called the Black and Tan uh, Constitutional Convention in uh, Louisiana uh, following the Civil War that actually ended with the appointment of a, uh, an African-American lieutenant governor who subsequently became, uh, became governor, um, an African-American governor of Louisiana uh, all the way back in the, 18, uh, in, the, in the 1860s and 70s, really remarkable. And uh, over the years, I'd worked on different projects in, in Africa, as you've mentioned in the uh, in your introduction, I've worked in uh, Rwanda, uh, South Sudan, Darfur, South Africa. 
Um, I was not uh, particularly familiar with Mauritania and the situation there until I read this amazing article, uh, actually more than just an article, uh, a, a photo, video, essay by John Sutter called Slavery's Last Stronghold. Uh, I, came across, I came across the piece in 2012 and like anybody who reads the piece then or now uh, was shocked by the brutality of the system, the stories from survivors, uh, the way that uh, slave owners, slave masters were never held accountable for their crimes. You had people advocating against slavery for the, the crime of advocating against slavery are uh, thrown in prison, uh, uh, have to risk their lives um, just to do, ju ju just for, um, you know, advocating against something that's obviously a, a crime against humanity. I, I was, I was shocked by what I read, shocked at how easy it was for uh, John from CNN uh, to find evidence and um, uh, clear evidence of what was ha what was happening in the country and also that there was no American group that was working on the topic so uh, it was actually election night of 2012 when I when I read the story and I thought you know elections are important that's what I do but as soon as we get through this on the other end you know, I'd like to reach out to people in my network and, and see if there's an appetite here for doing something on this issue you know Illinois, uh, known as the land of Lincoln, an integral role in the uh, the effort to abolish slavery. Not just you know, not just President Lincoln, but abolitionists uh, all throughout the all throughout the state. If if any state has a lead role to play in fighting slavery in the 21st century, it's it's Illinois, and it just took off over um, over the next few months. I started talking to people in the uh, in the advocacy field, folks I'd worked on political campaigns with. Uh, people in the nonprofit sector, and once they read the CNN piece, uh, everybody wanted to wanted to get on board. So, uh, like a lot of movements, uh, started with a meeting. Uh, started with a meeting in my uh, in my condo, and and gr grew from there. Um, and and of course, a, a key to things really taking off was uh, meeting Tanja um, under the auspices of the uh, Open Society Institute in um, in New York. So I'll, I'll let him talk a little bit about uh, about his background. Please. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean, for your amazing uh, background and your passion for human rights around the world, uh, you know, particularly uh, in uh, Africa. So my name is uh, Bakuri Tanja. I am from Mauritania. So for me, uh, slavery is not something uh, new. Uh, I didn't get into it by, you know, by accident. I, I was born in Mauritania, raised there. I know for fact that uh, slavery is a, a reality. It is a, it is a part of uh, a daily life of uh, 10 of thousand of Mo uh, black Mauritanians. And, uh, you know, besides that, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have uh, also the racial element waved into, uh, you know, slavery. Uh, because those who are enslaved, you know, the masters are uh, the um, Arabs who are ruling the country. Okay. So we have, a, you know, a discriminatory aspect, you know, to, to it. And... Uh, uh, beside uh, slavery, there are so many other types of uh, terrible and serious, uh, you know, human rights violations. So, you know, that's why uh, since I was in Mauritania, I was already involved, you know, in the struggle to end uh, slavery and uh, uh, to end racial discrimination, to promote human rights and democratic, uh, you know, governance. Uh, so I, uh, when I decided to come to the U.S., my main mission was to take advantage of the opportunities here, uh, you know, the culture of civil rights movement, mm -hmm. uh, the big human rights organizations, and uh, to try to echo, you know, the voices raising from Mauritania against slavery and human rights violations. 
uh, it was a, a very big challenge uh, because when I came here, I didn't speak English. So if you want to advocate uh, and get into, uh, you know, the public uh, arena, explain, you know, explain issues, convince people to be on board, it was not uh, easy at all. But when you have the determination, the vision, and the courage, you know, to do something, uh, you will always uh, be successful, you know, in doing it. I remember when I arrived here, the first thing we did uh, was to buy a fax machine uh, for leaders in Mauritania, because in order to, at that time there was no, uh, e you know, email, let alone, uh, uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter, you know. So the only way to communicate with them to get documentation, because you cannot do human rights uh, work in isolation. You have to be connected with people on the ground who are doing the work, uh, you know, so that you can exchange, you know, uh, exchange information, get updates on what is taking place. Uh, so we got a fax machine uh, for the leaders in Mauritania and the organizations, and we got one here uh, so that we can communicate. This is how, you know, we started the work uh, here in, uh, you know, in the U.S. Uh, so uh, with courage, with, uh, you know, determination, uh, we made, you know, uh, 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 connections. Uh, one leads to another. And this is how I get to know, uh, you know, Sean. And my philosophy and vision is that when you are working or fighting for a noble cause, no matter uh, how much limited you are in your work, you will always come across, you know, the right people who will join the fight and move it forward. And this is exactly what happened with Sean. So whenever I talk about this story, I always say that it has, it has been a blessing, you know, uh, to meet Sean on my path. Uh, so this happened here in New York, in the beautiful city of uh, uh, New York, at, uh, you know, Open Society mm -hmm. uh, with another great lady, uh, Julia uh, Harrington, uh, who he has done, uh, you know, wonderful work uh, in Mauritania. Uh, so since then, we decided to uh, form the organization, Abolition Institute. And mm -hmm. since then, we have done an amazing and, you know, impressive work. Uh, Abolition Institute has become the epicenter of the struggle against slavery in Mauritania. Uh, it has become the, re you know, the reason for so many people in Mauritania uh, to have hope, you know, that you know one day they will, uh, you know, they will succeed mm -hmm. in their fight. Uh, so uh, everybody, you know, abolition institute is so well known in Mauritania; uh, it's beyond imagination. Uh, you know, so people are very proud of the organization and they count on the work we do uh, here. Yeah, it's a, um, it's an amazing organization. You, you two have an amazing synergy. Um, I'd like to, um, the first place I want to go, I just want to sort of define a couple of things for the audience to, because in this basket that we'll call slavery, this evil basket of, of things um Asking they're deplorable, one might, yes one might extremely deplorable beyond evil um there are forms of slavery that we hear about in the news whether they be human trafficking debt bondage uh, uh forced labor and so forth we are talking here and especially for sort of the u.s audience that study the emancipation proclamation 13th amendment and so forth we are talking chattel slavery here uh think back to the 1800s in the united states um, I guess, the, you know, so here we are, 
we we abol- we had an abolition in the United States 150 some odd years ago. 1981 was the year the Mauritania abolished slavery, but there was no law put in place uh, for any of this. So there really there was no structure after 1981. Hence, it really didn't get abolished. Um, talk a little bit about sort of where this I, you mentioned sort of the Muslim African. Uh, this is African connection. Where did this? Why in 2021 are we talking about this issue? I, it, 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 it's a shocking issue that most people, you know, will listen to this. They, they have no idea this is going on. Um, what is the need for slavery in Mauritania? Who's driving it? What is a master? What is a slave? Walk through some of this dynamic, if you would. And, and both of you tag team on this one in any way that you feel comfortable. Tanja, could you take the lead? Uh, oh, okay, so uh, it is a very uh, interesting situation. We know that in Mauritania it is so uh, you know complex. Uh, to give you an idea, I will just uh, you know provide a brief description of uh, you know the composition of the situation. Uh, in Mor- Mauritania, it became independent in 1960. Uh, you know, since then, you know, independence from uh, from France in 1960. Since then, uh, the uh, uh, you know the the minority Arab are you know, you know ruling the country. So we have you know the Arabs. Uh, we have you know Africans uh, living in the south along the Senegal River Valley. Yeah. They include Fulani, Soninke, Wolof, and uh, also you have a small population of uh, Bambara toward the east. Uh, you know in uh, Nima, uh, Nima and Ayun, you know region. And then uh, you have the Haratin. You know the Haratin is you know the largest population of you know the uh, you know the country. Mm. So they are the slaves and former uh, former slaves. So when we talk about slavery in Mauritania, we are not talking about people uh, being taken into slavery. It is complete, as you well mentioned. It is completely different from uh, human trafficking right. or forced labor. Right. It is a classic traditional form of slavery. People who have been enslaved for, for, for centuries, uh, even though they still live uh, in the same geographical uh, area, you know, they have been completely assimilated to their masters. Uh, they speak Arabic even though uh, they came from the other uh, African uh, ethnic groups, Soninke, Fulani, and Wolof, uh, they don't speak, speak any of those languages, and their African names have been completely uh, you know, erased. Mm. So that is you know, the situation you know, in Mauritania. Uh, so uh, slavery is still there, it is a decent base. If you are a slave woman, your children will uh, become automatically, uh, you know, slaves. So the, you know, the, you know, the transfer of slavery status is done through the mothers, you know, you know the uh, line, because whoever owns, you know, the woman will be the owner of the children. Mm. So maybe I stop here to let uh, Sean, uh, you know, complete. Sure. Well, uh, what I think is really uh, I- interesting about working on the issue is the parallels between uh, the American experience and the Mauritanian experience. So Tanja talked about the ways in which the type of slavery um, the, the ways in which uh, there are similarities between uh, what exists in Mauritania now and what existed in the United States before the Civil War. Mm-hmm. The fact that families can be broken up. In fact, in Mauritania, many times families are broken up specifically to prevent enslaved people from having uh, human relationships and uh, webs of connection that might lead them to be able to escape. If you're completely isolated, uh, in, in, in the desert at your master's property, um, 
how would you how would you even conceive of a way to escape? Who would you go to? How would you know which direction to, to run to? Uh, if it's all you've ever known, uh, anything different is very, very frightening. Um, the fact that women's bodies are essentially the property of the master as well, uh, that rape, sexual assault is, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a, a regular part of everyday existence. Um, I'd say it's uh, it's not not a not a bug, but a, a feature of the system. That that parallel, unfortunately, is uh, is crystal clear. And of course, just the physical uh, brutality and, and degradation. Um, you know, I always think of it as the you know the worst parts of that slavery system that we uh, that we had in the country, but you know, in an area that unfortunately has not, um, you know, is not at the, the center of the world's media attention. And, uh, and that's part of the problem. And also in, in organizing and fundraising on the issue, it just seems so unbelievable to people that you, you have to, um, you have to really uh, dig deep to let people know, uh, to, to help people understand how this can still exist in the 21st century. So, you know, I think about the laws and proclamations that were passed in Mauritania and how similar they were to some laws and proclamations that were uh, passed here that really had little effect. Um, so the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, I think now it's becoming more common knowledge, but certainly in the history textbook, it was viewed as though there was this one piece of paper that was signed by, uh, by President Lincoln and then all the slaves were automatically freed. Of course, not, not a single slave was freed uh, by that piece of paper. It only freed slaves in areas where the Union Army had no reach. Uh, so the functional equivalent was of us saying, we're going to uh, you know, liberate everybody living in, in slavery in Mongolia. We, we had no power to enforce it at the right. time. And it was, of course, a military measure. And uh, you know, President Lincoln, up until the waning days of the war, had you know considered cutting a deal that would have allowed slavery to continue uh, practically into the into the next century. So, uh, the post Civil War amendments that, on paper, unequivocally abolished slavery. Um, of course, we know from the following hundred years of history that uh, slavery, uh, by another name, took place. Um, people who, uh, by the very nature of being um, on the plantations, suddenly technically freed, uh, had nowhere to go, nowhere to support themselves, and soon found themselves arrested under vagrancy laws, and then put in prisons, and then farmed out to the same plantation owners to work the fields just as they had before. Uh, and it, of course, there are instances of, uh, I think, race-driven uh, forced labor in prisons, uh, not just in the South, but around the country that follow that follow that same line. So, you know, we saw a uh, hundred years of those uh, printed words in the Constitution being, uh, being ignored in the United States. And then in Mauritania, as you said, the 1981 abolition, uh, was was really just a, a, a proclamation. There was no law put into effect to codify what was to be done, uh, both, uh, you know, as as punishment for slaveholding um, or as restitution for the enslaved person. In 2017, it was finally criminalized. Mm -hmm. uh, or I'm sorry, in 2007, it was finally criminalized. But one thing that I just couldn't get out of my head from our most recent visit to Mauritania, and I've been there three times, and e each time you do learn, you do learn more and more. You know, for all the uh, uh, talk of of progress from folks who want to maintain the status quo, the fact remains, uh, you know, in the the several hundred year history of uh, slave owning in, in in this area, the number of people who have actually served meaningful jail time for this titanic crime of enslaving other human beings is one. Now there have been people who've uh, been in jail for a few days or people who were accused and then they, uh, you know, they threw some money, some influence around and were able to get out. But, you know, that, that to me just overrides all the excuses and all the, uh, all the proclamations and the signing of treaties and all the smoke and mirrors, you know, it, it, as Tanja said, when we've discussed this, it's it's not even a shame it's not even a, a shameful thing if if somebody was um, 
arrested for uh, it's my from what I learned on on, on the trip. Uh, people said if somebody was arrested for the crime of slaveholding, really in the eyes of their peers, the embarrassment would not be that they were holding slaves. The embarrassment was maybe that they didn't have enough clout that they uh, that they got caught, and that there, there's just no um, there's no way to um, you know take at face value the the you know proclamations that a hard line is being uh, drawn against against slave owners unless there is unless there is real real punishment. Is yeah, you know exactly. Yeah. As I uh, said in one of uh, the article I wrote, uh, Mauritania doesn't have a problem of legislation. Right. Uh, we have all the laws, uh, you know, in the book. Uh, slavery has been elevated as a crime against humanity. Uh, the government has set up special tribunals dealing with the issue of slavery, but they are empty. They are not functioning. And, uh, they, you know, they are not doing anything. But, you know, the real problem is there is no, uh, uh, no real political will mm. on the part of the government and authorities to uh, end the practice of slavery in Mauritania. Uh, you know, the reason for that is, uh, is, is simple. Uh, number one, they don't consider slaves and former slaves and blacks in general as fully, you know, human, mm. you know. So they, for, for them in their thinking, in, in their psyche, uh, you know, they are not worth to rule the country. So in order to, to retain power, uh, you know, and, the, and control the economy, you know, they have to maintain the overwhelming majority of the population on the, you know, that condition. And, we, and what is really, uh, uh, you know, shocking and uh, strange in Mauritania is that the democratic process is producing a, re a reversal uh, e effect. Hmm. How? You know, you know, for instance, uh, now we have, you know, elections. We have a national assembly. Uh, you know, uh, the president is, uh, you know, elected. But, and what is really, you know, shocking is that if you own slaves, your slaves will vote but they will vote according to your instructions. What this means is that if you have 100 slaves, it means that you have a constituency of 100 mm. uh, votes. So instead of uh, you know the democratic you know the democratic process making the system. Uh, fair and equal is giving more power to those who enslave, uh, you know, the other fellow, uh, you know, uh, uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. I, I know it is it, it is conflicting when you talk about you know democracy and how democracy sure. is 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 playing to give more power to those who are involved in the practice of of, of slavery. And conversely, it is not, you know, freeing uh, slaves, but putting more chains, uh, you know, on them. So to, you know, to, to, to summarize the whole problem why, uh, you know, those people, slavery is still going on in Mauritania is to retain the political power and to keep enjoying, uh, you know, the resources of the country. Amazing. You know, in my, uh, you know, I, I was uh, recently at the Illinois Holocaust Museum's new exhibit on South Africa and Nelson Mandela the other day, mm -hmm. and I got to thinking about the the parallels. You know, how does such a small percentage of any country keep the large majority of that country in um, uh, in 
uh, subservience you know, in uh, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, and, uh, other settler communities, and in, in, in Mauritania, and you know whoever has the whoever has the the, the guns, whoever has the uh, you know the the state you know if the state has a monopoly on force and, and violence, there's no limit to the disparity that you can have between. Um, you know, a minority group having having majority power, and you know, as uh, as I've traveled throughout the country, I, I, in Mauritania, I think, you know, given you know, given that uh, the, the vast majority, eighty percent of the um, you know of the population is is not of the slaveholding caste, um, how, how how do they keep power? How are they not just voted out, voted out 80, 80, 20? and I think you know. Unfortunately, the uh, you know the unequal distribution of wealth in the country, and uh, you know, and poverty in the country means that you know if a family is struggling, uh, a family is struggling to survive, and has to use every uh, every waking moment to to try to figure out how to um, produce food, how to get food out of the environment where ninety percent of the land is not. Uh, is not arable. Um, politics, uh, advocacy, um, the movement, it becomes, it, 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 it seems like uh, fundamental change is so far off in the distance that y you just need to use every ounce of energy you have to, to keep yourself alive. Yep. And I, I think, uh, I think, I think that's certainly by design, uh, both in the way that uh, people were forced into systems after the Civil War that were reminiscent of slavery. They were forced into sharecropping and other horrible situations by sheer desperation. And, and uh, the the, the uh, white landowners knew that. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the the hoarding of resources by uh, by the group in power. I mean, it just perpetuate perpetuates that cycle. And you know, hopefully, with uh, hopefully with more development, we certainly did see uh, more development. I, I, so I've been in Mauritania in 20, uh, 2015, 2017, and now in, in 2021. Uh, there definitely are positive signs of mm -hmm. development. I um, saw so the first Western hotels going up. Mm -hmm. uh, the hotel that we stayed at was a, um, was a beautiful place. There were uh, business conferences for. Um, uh, both men and women, entrepreneurs, uh, business competition. Um, that, that's wonderful to see, but that puts the uh, puts the onus on advocacy groups to say to companies, like, we, we want you to invest there. We want everybody to have a good future in the country, but you have to do it in, in the right sure. way. You know, it, it can't be purely uh, extractive um, as it as it was in many cases when, uh, you know, when Europeans went into South Africa. Sure. Talk um, both of you, and once again, you can you can take this in the uh, order you want. But I know you both were recently in Mauritania on on uh, with with a, a broad delegation of folks, uh, lawyers and professors and imams and judges. Um, talk about the current trip. Uh, what did you learn? And then, uh, Tanja, well, last time we chatted, you you had just come back from Mauritania at that time, I believe, and you you had run into some friction. I. I remember there were some issues during your travels. Uh, any issues that you guys ran into together this time uh, that you want to talk about? Uh, you know, this time it was uh, completely, uh, you know, different. Okay. Uh, different, uh, you know, which is an indication that uh, uh, advocacy works. Yep. You know, what we do here, uh, may, uh, you know, has made, you know, an, a real impact uh, you know, because, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as a result of uh, our expulsion in 2017, uh, you, know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mauritania, uh, you know, lost uh, Agoa. Agoa, which, uh, you know, mainly, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, mainly, uh, you know, is beneficial to, you know, the wealthy business Mauritanians. And not you know the slaves or black Africans who are uh, struggling you know to, you know to, to survive to su uh, survive you know beside the uh, economic you know benefit 
it, it, you know, it is also, you know, uh, shameful for the country uh, to lose uh, that privilege. So because of that, uh, they uh, really wanted us, the Abolition Institute, you know, to come back to Mauritania, mm -hmm. uh, to especially on the, you know, the new president, you know, to show that, you know, the situation has changed. They are open to uh, international human rights organizations. But that's why this time uh, to give them some, you know, some credit, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sean can, uh, uh, you know, testify we were very well received at, mm. uh, at, at uh, you know at the airport. We didn't run into any 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 problem, cool. and uh, during our visit, we were able to meet uh, with uh, uh, you know the officials, uh, human rights organizations, and uh, victims. I yeah uh, you know I want to let uh, Sean uh, elaborate on that. That uh, you know the delegation was very very imp impressed. It was a very diverse uh, group of people, uh, passionate about you know human rights, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you know included uh, you know judges, lawyers, uh, human rights activists, uh, public relations experts, uh, imams, uh, scholars, advocates. It, it really it was a very interesting uh, you know group. Well, I, I, I would echo uh, Tanja's comments about, uh, about AGOA and just by way of background, so AGOA stands for the African Growth and Opportunity Act, okay. uh, which was a, a law passed by Congress and signed by the president that uh, established positive trading terms for African nations that met certain human rights standards. Um, similar in some ways to the, uh, maybe the more familiar term is uh, most favored nation trading status. Um, that was always a debate about whether or not China should have most favored nation trading status. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly something that brings a lot of uh, benefits to African nations that, that meet the, meet the criteria. So uh, we were, uh, we were treated, uh, we were treated very well and given a lot of access when we were in Mauritania a few months ago. Um, I felt particularly helpful was being able to dialogue with members of the government. Uh, uh, that was something we obviously were not able to do in, uh, in, in 2019. And, you know, I found that in, you know, in social media conversations, um, you know, some folks would deny the problems, you know, what, what, what are you, you know, what are you doing? There's no slavery in Mauritania. This is all a big lie. Um, and to be able to say, well, actually, we met with uh, key ministers in the government who spoke very openly and honestly about the existence of slavery and what the government is doing to address it. So that, in and of itself, is a is an important a, an important change. I, you know, I think the very first uh, comment that the uh, uh, human rights minister from the government said is I have never been one of those people to deny the existence of slavery. Uh, let's talk about things openly and frankly. Here is what we are doing to address it. Uh, you may like or not like or find effective or not effective what we're doing, but but here it is. And, uh, you know, at no point did any uh, member of the government say uh, there is no there was no slavery here. Uh, and uh, if you go back in uh, media searches, going back decades, uh, it used to just be a simple, you know, that's a lie that doesn't, that doesn't exist here. Um, so we were able to meet with a, a wide array of, of stakeholders, of uh, people who had recently come out of slavery, people running programs at SOS Esclaves, uh, advocates um, from multiple organizations working against slavery, government, government ministers, mm -hmm. uh, cultural leaders. I, I feel like we were able to meet with a large uh, cross section of society in Mauritania and see what each group, each stakeholder group um, brought to the table in terms of the struggle, uh, their own experiences. And, you know, to me, it's amazing when Tanja talked about uh, the, uh, not too far back, but, uh, relatively recent days of advocacy when all this had to be organized without fax machines or cell phones <laughs> or email or Facebook or Twitter. My hat goes off to 
uh, the activists and organizers of an early time, and not just this movement, but in the abolition movement in the United States. I mean, now with the click of a button, we can say, you know, we're going to have an event outside, you know, outside an embassy, uh, put it on Facebook, 48 hours later, people will come. Um, but you know, folks in this struggle had to do it in the dead of night with the threat of prison, uh, horrible mistreatment, uh, you know, being ostracized from from the from their communities, you know, without these uh, technological benefits, it's uh, it boggles the mind how they were able to be so effective. So on the on the plus side, now we're able to so quickly share images uh, images and reports back and forth. Uh, one thing I really enjoy about the Abolition Institute work is the uh, the building of cultural. Uh, cultural exchanges fr and uh, friendships and bonds mm -hmm. between the two countries. You know, we, uh, we, you know, we don't go to the country to say that uh, Mauritania is bad or everybody in Mauritania is is, is racist. Sure. Uh, Lord knows we have uh, our own problems in our in our own country, and uh, we talk about that quite openly. We have many sessions about uh, what are the you know what are the similarities in in the struggles. So. You know, being able to bring uh, you know Chicago Bulls and Bears and and, uh, and and Cubs gear to Mauritania and bringing Mauritanian cultural uh, cultural gifts back to the United States and you know building building friendships between mayors in both in both countries, political leaders in both countries, artists in both countries. Um, that 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 is very important because we we want. We want folks over there to know that they're not alone, and there's a, a huge number of people here in Chicago and New York who, you know, who who feel that they're brothers and sisters, and you know, we care deeply about what happens to them, and they're and they're not alone. And frankly, we learn a lot about uh, advocacy, uh, a, a lot about advocacy from them that can be used in you know advocacy for uh, uh, racial justice and similar causes in the United States. Uh, so never have we said. Uh, you know the country. We 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 are not around to uh, tear down the country. We're here to uh, hopefully raise raise up and shine a spotlight on the voices and activities of abolitionists in Mauritania who are doing this important work. Outstanding. Yeah, really. The uh, yeah, you know, and also our delegation was a very interesting delegation. And the mission is, itself was uh, very innovative. It was not a classic uh, human rights uh, you know, mission. Mm. Uh, so many components uh, were uh, covered. Uh, the artist part, uh, you know, uh, was very interesting. And, uh, you know, myself, I am uh, considering to change my professional lane uh, because during our stay, uh, you know, the, the artists, uh, we, we have all made, almost, you know, uh, tr you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, introduced me uh, into, uh, you know, into, sing into singing. So I am uh, really exploring, uh, you know, that opportunity. Uh, it, it was wonderful, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the connection was not just during the meetings, you know, people right. naturally and freely connected with you know, one another and forge a strong bounds. Uh, and everything was done uh, with, uh, with mutual respect, with consideration. And you can see during those sessions, uh, hope uh, raising through the eyes of the victims and the activists. You know, the fact that we were there, yep. physically present, eating and drinking and laughing with them, it was not like we and them. We were together, working together. And, uh, you know, they have no doubt that from now on, we are one team, they are not alone, they can count on us. And also, 
you know, you know, our main our host organization, uh, SOS uh, Slave, mm -hmm. has its own headquarters, yep. an impressive a building. We did not rent, uh, you know, a conference room uh, in a hotel or anywhere else. Right. All the activities, main activities, took place within the headquarters. They have nice rooms, a clean, well-organized building. You know, anyone who entered into the building was very, very impressed. And, and there was a buzz about the building too. Um, there were so many activities going on that were un unrelated to our visit. Um, mm. You know, this is a building that was constructed, uh, you know, in part thanks to uh, State Department uh, uh, funds that we advocated for to uh, to go to the effort to fight slavery in the region. And you can just tell when there's an office that's humming uh, and, and work, uh, good good work is being done. You know, I, sometimes I think I could fly out there and uh, jump into a conference room and people would be so busy doing their uh, do, doing their work, probably, probably would go, probably would go unnoticed. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it was really humming and, and that is certainly to the credit of, uh, uh, of, of the staff, but also say uh, we met with a, a group of lawyers who have been doing this work for many years and it's extremely difficult. Um, the, as we've talked about, the legal system is, um, stacked on the other side to put sure. it to put it mildly um you know imagine trying to advocate for your clients you know in a situation where you know the, the government the judges the police uh, everybody in that system is is not uh not predisposed uh, to to your side and all the power and the infrastructure of uh, the government is is on the other side and sometimes i think in the u.s it's you know, it's 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 fun to uh, you know put out statements and draw awareness, but you know that real work goes on in you know in these uh, you know in these these legal offices where people are uh, pouring through the uh, you know the day to day facts of these cases, um, cases that take uh, take years to prove, and it's. Uh, you know, even I, I'm sure they would admit, you know, it's uh, it's hard work and it's tedious and it's isolating um, and it, it probably seems endless, but that that type of work is integral to getting uh, getting change to come to the ground. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and also another aspect also is that uh, while in Mauritania, almost everybody, organizations, individuals, they all wanted to meet with us. <laughs> it was impossible to meet their expectations, you know. It's all like, uh, you know, this is my chance to talk to them. It's yep. my uh, opportunity uh, to share my story. Mm -hmm. It was it was really, you know, amazing. I cannot tell you how many phone calls I was on the, uh, you know, a constant, you know, uh, you know uh, pressure because we had already, uh, you know, certain uh, uh, workshops and, and meetings scheduled, but people say, no, uh, I have to uh, really uh, get my, uh, in my one minute to talk to them or to get a picture or, what, you know, whatever I can get, you know, I have to get my share. Oh, yeah. I, I, and I'll just share a couple projects that we're working on that are a direct result of this trip. Sure. Um, so I've been involved in... Uh, uh, breast cancer advocacy movement for uh, for about 20 years. I've yep. served as president of the Komen Foundation in uh, Komen Foundation's Chicagoland affiliate, worked on advocacy at the state and federal level. And the uh, the very last meeting we had actually was from uh, a woman who had started a grassroots breast cancer uh, education and awareness organization um, for uh, uh, Haratine women. And she talked about the the, the the struggle. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, imagine the barriers you face uh, being in slavery, coming out of slavery, and then having a breast cancer diagnosis where, uh, you know, culturally, I mean, you're the, 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 uh, the stigma, of course, and that's uh, certainly same in our country as well. The stigma is very intense. Uh, the health, the inequality of the health infrastructure is very intense. 
you know, take two of the worst things that somebody could possibly experience, uh, that type of cancer and uh, being, uh, being in, in, enslaved and robbed yeah. of your, your humanity and your rights and put them together. And uh, it, it really struck me when, um, uh, when I came back, talked to uh, Halil Demir at the Zakat Foundation, which is one of the uh, largest and most effective uh, uh, American Muslim charities. Um, I sh showed the photo of, uh, of uh, the woman who led this organization and she was uh, holding, up the, uh, you know, holding up her materials. Mm -hmm. And within a week or two, they were working to get uh, funding to that organization so that they can spread the word about uh, early detection of breast cancer, uh, that just the fundamental uh, building blocks of an education and awareness uh, program. And, you know, that would not have happened without this, um, you know, without this meeting of, of, our, of our two groups. So uh, hoping to do much more work on the breast cancer front. And um, we are, uh, you know, we are trying to help uh, people with medical conditions, uh, maybe find partners in the United States who might be able to uh, pr provide uh, provide treatment. So it's it's holistic. You you can't yeah. say that the only that the only component to ending slavery is um, you know uh, uh, going in and helping people you know uh, helping people get in the van and get out and just end it there. That right. that doesn't work. People yeah. people would in many cases go back if they if they don't have a way to get food in their bellies or uh, to make a living and then. If, you're, if other members of your family are still in slavery, it's a lot of work, a lot of holistic work to help somebody succeed and thrive um, outside of slavery, especially considering the trauma that they have uh, suffered while they were in slavery. It's a, yeah, uh, you know, as uh, you, know, you said, you know, while we were there, we, uh, you, know, you know, we met with, uh, so many different organizations working on uh, you know different human rights uh, uh, issues you know for you know for instance we have uh, you know the widow association mm -hmm. uh, they have been existing for almost you know 30 years it is a group of uh, uh, women whose husband uh, had been killed uh, between 1989 to 1992 Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1993, the National Assembly passed an amnesty law to protect the officers who were, uh, you know, involved in those crimes. And uh, still, you know, they are fighting, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, this amnesty law can be, uh, you know, ended and, uh, you know, to ensure that, you know, they get, you know, justice for their husband and children and, you know, uh, Besides that, you know, we heard people talking about uh, land expropriation, you know, for instance, particularly from the South. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, uh, there is a new uh, civil registration system in Mauritania. Uh, if you are not, you know, registered, you know, currently, you cannot get, uh, you know, your uh, civil papers such as... Uh, uh, such as uh, you know your national ID. If you don't have it, your children will not be allowed to go to school. Mm -hmm. That uh, has been documented by uh, Human Rights Watch. You know, uh, in Senegal, we went to Senegal in Dakar. Uh, we had a press conference with uh, Maurit Mauritanian refugees uh, who have been living refugees camps since 1989. They were deported by their own government to, you know, to, you know, to Senegal. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, there are so many, so, so, you know, so many issues, but still, you know, people have the courage and the stamina to continue uh, fighting for what is uh, right for them. And. Uh, of, of all the issues out there, this is one that uh, deserves a really good fight. And uh, uh, you two gentlemen are definitely on the forefront of it. And once again, since, since the last time we chatted, you, you seem to have continued to make amazing progress. The synergies between you two are obvious. Um, what's what's up for 2022? Any Anything on the horizon that we should be 
looking out for in terms of more trips, conferences coming up, uh, media appearances, uh, please both take the floor. Well, uh, Rhymefest, who is a, a Grammy and Oscar winning uh, recording artist, hip hop artist, very, very popular in Chicago and around the country. Um, soon he's gonna be releasing uh, uh, a photography book, uh, an album, and a whole multimedia suite of materials related to this trip to help uh, generate awareness and funds for the cause. So you know, we'll be working on that rollout soon. And uh, as I think I mentioned before, a lot of the songs, a lot of the performances, well, all of them, come to think of it, were uh, American and Mauritanian artists working together. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be that's going to be really exciting. You think of some of the, uh, you know, the legendary uh, musician-led uh, human rights movements, uh, and it, always it was it was collaborations between yep. both, uh, you know, between both sides that really made a magic. Uh, you know, Paul Simon uh, working in, in South America and, and South Africa. Peter, Ga uh, Peter Gabriel and, and uh, the, uh, working with the anti-apartheid movement. So yep. really excited about that. Um, we're also gonna be uh, continuing to work to have dialogue between uh, Muslim leaders from both countries, um, maybe some travel going, going in either direction uh, between uh, the imams involved in Abolition Institute and imams from, uh, from Mauritania. And I also enjoy just the, again, the, the sharing of, of images uh, in each, direction that, you know, that, that show that there, you know, this is not all, uh, it is not all doom and gloom. Like we are here, uh, we are here to elevate the amazing work that has been done by our partners on the ground. And you have to show, you have to show the progress as well. Yep. And I think that was a really uh, impactful part of the trip is that, you know, to uh, Chicagoans, to people in the U.S., see that this isn't, um, you know, this isn't a problem that's just in the abstract. They need to be able to see photos of people who have come out of slavery and see uh, some of my favorite photos are, you know, of my wife and uh, women who are in the uh, uh, vocational training program at SOS Esclaves. Uh, didn't didn't speak the same language and in fact uh, have to be uh, translated from the local dialect to French and then French to English. But you could tell when you see everybody together that despite the language barriers, um, these friendships were, were built, uh, people are working together. And, uh, you know, that's, that's part of the reason that people do uh, go through the, uh, the expense and the work of making, uh, you know, making physical trips to places, because that's something that just can't be replicated uh, via a, a, a computer screen or a text message. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, you know, the fact that uh, we as a delegation we were able to go to Mauritania to do this amazing uh, work. I, uh, as a Mauritanian who has been doing this work, I uh, see it as a, a personal achievement, you know. And also it is very important uh, uh, because, you know, members of, uh, you know, of the organization, the board members and others were able to go to Mauritania to see it, you know, for themselves instead of me always explaining, you know, things, they feel right. empowered to talk about it. No one can challenge them because they can say, I've been there. Because sometimes if you uh, don't have that practical and direct experience, you know, someone may say, no, you, you know, what you, what, what are you talking about? You've never been right. to Mauritania and this right. and that, uh, you know, to present cheap arguments. But if you, if, you know, if you have the, that practical experience, uh, you know, uh, you can uh, boldly say to the person, I've been to Mauritania. We, we met with, uh, you know, the Minister of Justice, the Minister of, uh, uh, you know, Interior, the Commission of Human Rights, Human Rights Organizations. We did this with that. That will really empower, uh, you know, their advocacy work and, uh, you know, from here, people will pay more attention to what they are, you know, uh, saying. And, and also uh, through these images, we're able to show also the beauty of the country and of the Mauritanian people. You know, yeah. of course, anytime you post 
food photos, uh, uh, <laughs> things are going to skyrocket. So yeah, we yeah. always made sure to point out the wonderful hospitality uh, from the people in Mauritania. Uh, the, the food was amazing, particularly if you like seafood, which I do. And, uh, you know, again, it, it can't be all uh, uh, negativity. Right. We have to show um, and, and, and certainly to, you know, give respect to uh, people on, on all sides who, oh, yeah. um, who, who really went the extra mile to, um, you know, to, to welcome us. Yeah. And as I said before on, you know, if, if people were, when people were to say things like slavery doesn't exist, you're being taken for a ride. This is just a, you know, this is just a ploy uh, to be able to say, well, not only did we meet with, uh, you know, dozens of, of, people, primarily women, who had come out of slavery and talked about it firsthand. We met with ministers in the government who yeah. talked about slavery, what is being done, what is being done to fight it, but in no way denies the fact that. that yeah, no way. No and if way. somebody were to say, uh, well, why don't you fight slavery in your own country? I would say uh, nearly everybody in our group, our stakeholders group, um, is on the vanguard of racial justice movements in the United States. And, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, picking up African-American, uh, African-American men, putting them in, in jail without uh, due process or without fair trials because they can't afford a good lawyer yeah. and then sending them out to work on, on, on farms. Uh, yeah, that's, that's slavery too. So in no way, shape or form are we saying that uh, no. America is perfect. What we're saying, we got to both work and help each other out. Yeah, and uh, you know, besides that, on uh, at the national level, you know, particularly the Congress and uh, you know the elected officials, uh, the administration. Now, after this, you know, you know, experience, uh, we are more equipped, you know, to talk to them, and uh, they, uh, uh, you know, they will become more interested in learning about our, our experience. But we know that with this, uh, you know, COVID world, uh, yeah, you, you know, direct contact, uh, organizing trips, uh, advocacy trips is not easy. Uh, but uh, when the time comes, uh, we will really uh, exploit, you know, those, uh, you know, opportunities. Besides that, uh, also we received feedback uh, from... Uh, the communications officer of SOS, uh, uh, you know, slaves, yeah, about uh, you know the you know the impact, we, you know, we have uh, we have made. Uh, I said, you know, the, the the visit has elevated, you know, the profile of the organization, and empowered, uh, you know, the leaders, and the government is uh, paying more attention, you know, to them. And uh, also, they are more open, uh, you know, to work with them. So I think, uh, you know, that it is a very, very important element uh, to get uh, this statement from the communications officer. And, and thank you, Ira, for uh, giving us a platform. I mean, th this organization was, uh, was inspired by the work of journalists who uh, wanted to help share the story. And the, the, the lifeblood is uh, uh, journalists and concerned parties around the, around the world who, who want to continue to tell the story. So uh, yeah, we, we appreciate that. Yeah, I, um, as I said, when I first talked to uh, Tandia about a year ago, uh, it was, it, it, it was uh, yeah, this is say a shocking topic, but uh, mm -hmm. a message of hope. And now a year later, really it's, it's seeing this synergy uh, seeing the progress you made and seeing where you're going with this. It's just, it, it's a story that uh, I think has to be shared and I, I'm glad that I could be part of that as well. Um, yeah, once again, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode on the, uh, the podcast networks or watching uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to both uh, Bakari Tandia and Sean Tanner, the co-founders of the Abolition Institute. Um, gentlemen, I, I just want to, once again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to, to come talk uh, to us for a little while about what you're up to. Thank you for everything you're doing. And as we say on our show, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow, and especially for 
all those folks in Mauritania. Um, really an extremely inspiring story of hope. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you very much for helping us uh, do our work. We'll be in touch soon. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.